now broken down in Jesus and though we are still different he makes us one We are one where the family of God The gentle, old and young Every nation, every tongue We are one where the family of God We were dead in sin and helpless Now made us Good morning. good morning. It is good to be with you. It is good to be together. I delight in your presence and your friendship and that we are family. Amen? Amen. Would you join me in prayer? <clears throat> Holy, awesome, mighty, wonderful, good and gracious God, we come to you today. We come knowing that you invite us to draw near, to draw close, to rest in your presence. Lord, in all of our striving, in all of our doing, in all of our hustle and bustle, in all of our weakness, in all of our victories, in all of our doubts, in all of our fears, in all of our rejoicing, in all of our praising, may we continually find ourselves turning towards you, drawing near to you, growing in faith, growing in trust. We come this morning because we want to draw nearer to you. We want to learn and understand more of who you are and who you are calling us to be. We thank you that you have created us in your image, that you have breathed life into us, that you call us your own, your children, your sons, your daughters. We thank you for Christ, for the ways that he has redeemed and transformed and continues to save us. We thank you for that continued salvation that Christ has made possible in our lives. We come to worship you. You are worthy of all our praise. But we come in spirit and in truth. And, and for some, that worship might look like tears. For others, that worship might look like anger. But they come to you. And in coming to you, that is our act of worship. And we come just as we are. We come honestly. We come vulnerably. We come authentically. Because you invite us to come. And we know that you will never turn your back on us. You'll never leave us. You will never forsake us. And so we come with the confident assurance that you care, that you are listening, and that you are at work making beauty out of the brokenness, working all things together for the good of those who love you. So work in us goodness. Work in us beauty. Heal our brokenness that we might reflect more of the image of Christ, that we might be better conduits of your blessings, that we might see our lives and our relationships, our community and our world transformed. And may it all be, because it's all through you, to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you join me in the responsive reading as it appears on the screen? We have been in the wilderness We have been in the wilderness. We have been in the wilderness. We have been in the wilderness, but we have not been alone, for God walks with us every step of the way.
let us worship holy God. Amen. I invite you to worship in spirit and in truth. You're welcome to stand or to sit however you best enter into worship. You can go on your knees, you can dance, you can clap. Let us worship God through song. of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name when i'm found in the desert place though i walk through the wilderness blessed be your name every blessing you pour out i'll turn When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name.
So as Pastor said, I'll be reading from Ezekiel 16, 1 to 3, 8, 15 to 25, and 60 to 63. The word of the Lord came to me. Mortal, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. I passed by you again and looked on you. You were at the age of, for love. I spread the edge of my cloak over you and covered your nakedness. I pledged myself to you and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord God, and you became mine. But you trusted in your beauty and prostituted yourself because of your fame and lavished your prostitutions on any passerby. You took some of your garments and made for yourself colorful, high places, and on them prostituted yourself. Nothing like this has ever been or ever shall be. You also took your beautiful jewels of my gold and my silver that I had given you and made for yourself, male images, and with them prostituted yourself. And you took your embroidered garments to cover them and set my oil and my incense before them. Also, my bread that I gave you, I fed you with choice flour and oil and honey. You set it before them as a pleasing odor. And so it was, says the Lord God. You took your sons and your daughters, whom you had born to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. As if your prostitutions were not enough. You slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering to them. And in all your abominations and your prostitutions, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, flailing about in your blood. After all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, says the Lord God. You built yourself a platform and made yourself a lofty place in every square. At the head of every street, you built your lofty place and prostituted your beauty, offering yourself to every passerby and multiplying your prostitution. Yet, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish with you an everlasting covenant. Then, you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your older and younger sisters. And I give them to you as daughters, but not on account of my covenant with you. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord in order that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth again because of your shame. When I forgive you all that you have done, says the Lord God. Reading from Psalm 51, 10 to 19. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. 
and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my mouth, my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your great pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bowls will be offered on your altar.
Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great whore who is seated on the waters, with whom the kings of the earth have engaged in sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose prostitution the inhabitants of the earth have become drunk. So he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her prostitution. And on her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of whores and the earth's abominations. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly amazed. But the angel said to me, why are you so amazed? I tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to ascend into the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundations of the world, will be amazed when they see the beast, because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Also, there are seven kings, of whom five have fallen, one is living, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are united in yielding their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he said to me, the waters that you saw were the whore, where the whore is seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the whore. They will make her desolate and naked. They will devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by agreeing to give the kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman you saw is a great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Matthew 23, 37 to 39. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are set to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. I lift my eyes to the mountain peak. Where does my help come from? It comes from you, maker of heaven and earth, who holds my foot firm on the path up, who's constantly present, everywhere aware, With you there is no obscurity, nothing is dim, asleep, inert, to those 
those who question and struggle, you respond. Keep hold. Give cover. So that by day the sun won't burn. Nor by night the moon will mesmerize. You guard against evil. Secure my departure. Now, always. We are going to continue in our worship now by the taking up of our tithes and offerings. And as you know, the offering box is at the front and you can leave your offering either before or after service, knowing that all that you give gets used to do and continue God's mission of the reconciliation and restoration of all things, to share what we have so that nobody is in need to listen and discern together what God is doing and get in on it. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly Son and Holy Ghost. Would you join me in prayer with the confident assurance that God has heard the praises that you have lifted up, the prayers that you have spoken, and He knows. He knows the things that haven't even come off your lips yet. He knows and he is at work. Gracious creator, we thank you that you are at work making all things new again, transforming be brokenness into beauty, working all things together for the good of those who love you. We pray for those who are grieving today. We think of Kathy's niece as she grieves the loss of her father, and we pray for strength and stability. We pray for peace and that you would help her to grieve well. I think of my family, God, as they grieve the loss of a brother, of an uncle, of a friend. I think of all those nurses and those PSWs and the dietitians who built such beautiful relationships. And I thank you for those workers in all the homes everywhere who do so much to contribute to the lives of those in their residence. And be with all those who grieve and see loss day after day. Lord, I pray for those who are dealing with physical infirmity and sickness. I think of Miss Gail, and we pray for her healing. We pray for clarity of mind, we pray for peace of spirit. We pray for strength and for length of days and years of quality life. We pray for Miss Sue as she prepares to go for surgery on the ninth. May it go without incident. May it not be canceled. May it be a complete, full, 
an easy recovery. Lord, we pray for Miss Donna Rennick, and we pray for strength for her, for peace, for your presence to indwell her and fill her and carry her through the valley that she walks. Lord, we pray for a quick sale of her home. We pray for, Lord, a transition into her new living space. We pray, God, for your strength to carry her through this time. We pray for the Nellis family. We pray for Kelly. Lord, that your nearness would be so tangible that he would sense your closeness and be encouraged and have peace. Be with the family, give them comfort and strength as they care for him and walk through this with him. We thank you for his faith. We thank you for his witness. We entrust him to you. God, we pray for everyone who is dealing with mental health struggles, whether it's anxiety or depression, OCD or bipolar, schizophrenia. Lord, we pray for those who, who feel despairing, suffering from suicidal ideations. Lord, give each one strength, but more than this, give each one hope. Surround them with people who will pour into their lives and speak words of truth and love and grace and mercy. May your truth vanquish the lies that fill their mind. And may you give them healing of any chemical imbalances that are waging war on their wellness, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for this church for all that you have done in and through this church, for the ways that I have witnessed transformation in those who call this their church home, for the ways that we have been conduits of blessings to those in our community. We do that only because you equip and enable us, because you provide for us, because you lead us, continue to lead us, God. Not our will, but your will be done. Not our agenda, but your agenda. This is your church. You are the shepherd. You are our pastor. Lord, continue to shape us and mold us and transform us and turn us upside right. Help us to have, to be brave and courageous, to try new things. Help us to step out in faith, doing things that are bigger than us, I pray. And as we enter into your word today, God, give us ears to hear, a mind to understand, a heart to receive, but most of all, the boldness to allow it to speak to us, to convict us, to encourage us, to transform us. May we allow these words to be lived out in our life to your glory and the blessing and flourishing of all others. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are drawing near to a close of our Revelation series. This morning we find ourselves in chapter 17. And today's message I titled, Who is the Whore in the Wilderness? Who is the Whore in the Wilderness? We begin as we do every message in this series with four reminders to ensure that you get the most out of this series on Revelation. For 20 weeks or more, you have heard these four invitations repeated. So I thought this morning I would ask, who can share with us what the first reminder is? What is the first reminder? Say it again. This is not a turn or burn fire and brimstone series. Thank you. Rather, it is meant to unveil the beauty of the gospel and more importantly, to inspire you to live out the gospel more beautifully, to know and love Christ more dearly and to follow Jesus more nearly. Who can tell me what the second reminder is? Second reminder. Deborah. We'll go to that one. That's number three. Take the meat and leave the bones. Very good. None of us can say with 100% certainty what revelation all meant 
or means. There are many valid scholarly interpretations for most of the texts. So do not let differences divide. Very good. Who can tell me one of the other two reminders? Come with an open mind. Thank you, Miss Sue. Come with an open heart, willing to listen and learn, willing to embrace that which will help you live out the gospel more fully and faithfully, and willing to let go of whatever hinders or harms the good news. Let go of what doesn't serve Christ and the kingdom. And what was the last one? Everyone should know this one. I am not an expert on this subject or any other for that matter. I do not come to you as an expert, thank you, Wayne, but rather one who, like you, has read Revelation and has been left with more questions than answers. And through my own continuing education, I chose to take a course on Revelation where I'm learning new things, where I'm getting a better understanding and a clearer picture so that I can pass that on to you. And so in today's message, I am leaning heavily on the instruction of and his paraphrasing insights from Father John Bear, with insights from Kenneth Tanner, Brad Jerzak, and John McMurray. And he draws heavily from Peter Lightheart's commentary, which I've been using throughout this series. A reminder that this and all previous messages in this series are available on our King's Court Free Methodist Church YouTube page, and are also posted to our Facebook page each Sunday evening. So author, scholar, and Eastern Orthodox priest, John Bear, led the teaching on, John, on Revelation 17. As mentioned in our last Revelation message, chapter 16 brought to a close the second of four visions that serve as a structure for the book of Revelation, where each vision builds upon the themes and elements of the previous one. The first vision was the vision of the Christ, followed by letters to the churches, exhorting them and encouraging them to endure. The second vision was the reaction on earth as the worship of Christ spread, which resulted in the exaltation of the slain lamb, followed by the exaltation of those who follow the lamb, particularly the martyrs. And so today we come to vision three. And as I mentioned last time, each vision is signified by John being in the spirit and seeing something. That's how you know when the vision begins. In verse three of chapter 17, we read, so he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness and I saw, there's the signifier. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names and it had seven heads and ten horns. And so begins the third vision of four in Revelation. And this third vision has four parts to it. And those four parts are spread out over the following five chapters. Here in chapter 17, verses 1 to 5, the vision is described. Then in verses 6 through chapter 18, 24, we're offered four angelic explanations of this vision. And then in chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, there is instruction for worship and instruction to write an invitation to the wedding feast. And then the vision concludes in chapter 19, verse 11 to 21, with visions of what is to come. And then the fourth and final vision begins in chapter 21, verse 9. So with that very brief review of the structure, let's return to the beginning of chapter 17 in Revelation. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, we've seen those seven angels with the seven bowls, with the trumpets. Come, I will show you the judgment of the great whore who was seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have engaged in sexual immorality and with the wine of whose prostitution the inhabitants of the earth have become drunk. The first thing to note is that this whore is not a literal woman. It's not even a single person. But it serves 
as a symbol, as an image, as a representation of something bigger. And we're going to discuss that a little more in a moment. The many waters the great whore is seated upon represents the many nations, as is explained a little later on in chapter 15, or in verse 15, saying, the waters that you saw where the whore is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. The influence and the impact of the harlot knows no boundaries. The sexual immorality, and this is important, the sexual immorality and prostitution that is mentioned here has little to do with physical act of sex and everything to do with unfaithfulness, with idolatry. Often when you see these ideas of, of prostitution, it's about unfaithfulness. It's about idolatry. The people have become drunk on this idolatry, this false religion, this partnering of power of the empire with the power of religion. This is a judgment of the harlot. The text continues in verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. So chapter 17 opens with a brief overview of what John is going to witness, and now the vision begins, as John is carried away in the spirit to the wilderness, where he sees a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. We were introduced to this beast with seven heads and ten horns full of blasphemous names back in chapter 13 of Revelation. The beast of earthly empire, worldly power, political power. So the woman is seated on, seated over the corrupt, unjust, oppressive empires of the world. Those persecuting the followers of Christ, oppressing and marginalizing any who were not in allegiance to them. In John's day, that was Rome. And this is alluded to in verse 9, where it is written, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Also, they are seven kings. Rome, a beast of burden to the people, was described in ancient manuscripts as being built on seven hills. In fact, and I'm going to have Nancy go to the next slide. In some of Rome's ancient coins, they literally have an image of a woman, the goddess Roma, sitting on the seven hills. But this beast does not only represent Rome. While the seven hills would resonate with John and his listeners, the word is mountains. And the word mountain used here is used symbolically, as it often is in Scripture, to depict kingdom power. And the number seven, as we've learned, depicts completion or wholeness. As we recall from chapter 13, the beast is a composite of all earthly empires opposed to the way of the Lamb. This beast rears its ugly head not only in John's day as represented by Rome and by Babylon, but in every generation, including our own. This beast represents the world systems in opposition to the way of the Lamb, spanning the ages with the rise of every king and emperor, ruler from Rome until today. The whore riding upon the seven mountains is in bed with the beast, with Rome, with empire, in political allegiance. All the kings of the earth are now serving her purposes. But who is this whore in the wilderness? With a better understanding now of the beast, let's return to the woman. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her prostitution. And on her forehead was written a name, a mystery, 
Babylon the great, mother of whores and of earth's abominations. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. So we get a sense here that that prostitution isn't simply a sexual act when it says she holds in her hands a golden cup full of the impurities of her prostitution. And it says she is clothed in purple and scarlet. Purple and scarlet echoes back to the curtains and the robes and the tabernacle. She's adorned in gold, represented by the high priest. She has jewels and pearls, all the adornments. On her forehead was written a name of mystery, like the scripture written on the foreheads of the high priest. Except here, as John Bear points out, she is named Babylon the Great. It's not scripture, because she is devoted to no one else, to no other God but herself. The cup filled with the blood of the martyrs is an abomination. She, though, is drinking it as if it is a victory trophy. You know, after, I think it's NASCAR races, they have the trophy and they pour the champagne in and they drink it. Is that what they do at NASCAR? I think so. It's as though she's drinking this blood of the martyrs from a victory trophy. She believes she has conquered. And so again, as John Bear explains, she is seated. She has enthroned herself royally like a queen, asserting her rule forevermore. What my dad would refer to as a legend in their own mind. It's interesting how the description of the woman has echoes to the vision of Jesus in chapter 1 but it's a cheap replica. It's a bad copy. Try as she may, she cannot duplicate the greatness of God. The vision John sees of Jesus brings Christ into focus. Well, here, we actually never see the woman. Only her vestments. Only that which adorns her. She is nothing more than a costume. She is a facade, an actor in a costume. At seeing all this, John says that he was greatly amazed. He marveled at the sight, and he was rebuked by the angel for it. This is the third time John has been rebuked in Revelation, which I, for one, have to tell you, I very much appreciate that. That even John does not fully understand what is going on, that John can miss the point in the moment, that even he is learning through this, gives me comfort as I seek to understand. The angel says, why are you so amazed? Is it that John could not believe it true? Or was he, like others, seduced by what he saw, the appearance of power and beauty? Was he drawn in for a moment by the sight of this harlot who has set herself up as a counterfeit temple, a pseudo-church? Lightheart offers that, like the writers of the Gospels who highlight the confusions and missteps of the disciples, John places himself within his vision, a floundering disciple who needs to be told when to lament, when to marvel, whom to worship. That brings me comfort. This is not the obvious pagan religions in bed with empire persecuting the followers of Christ, but it's something emanating from within. Looking like the church, like the people of God, but not the church. And we get a sense of this in the following verse. In verse 8, it is written, The beast that you saw was, and is not, and is about to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. Does that echo of anything for you? Do you hear the play on words here? How it sounds so close to the description of Christ, who was, and is, and is to come? And yet, it is at the same time so far from that. The beast was and is not and is about to ascend to destruction. 
so close but so far away. Christ and all those in him ascend to new life. The beast and all those in him ascend to destruction. This is a vision of the judgment of the harlot that is to come. A judgment that will result in the destruction of all that destroys. In the demise of everything that corrupts, ensnares, distorts, and kills. But again, who is this woman in the wilderness? Who is poor atop the beast? There's a couple of trains of thought on this, and they are very closely related. First, the woman represents Babylon. But like Rome, not simply the literal place of Babylon, but the spirit of Babylon. The spirit, which in contrast to Rome, does not rule through power and coercion, but through seduction. Through seduction to compromise. Seducing with temptations to pleasure and possession, power and position. I want us to think back just for a moment to chapter 12. For it's here that we read of a woman that fled to the wilderness. And now here in chapter 17, John is in the wilderness and sees a woman. Is it coincidental? Is the woman who fled to the wilderness in chapter 12 connected to the woman in the wilderness in chapter 17? We came to understand that the woman in chapter 12 represented Mary. She represented the church, each one of us. Could the woman of chapter 12 be the harlot here in chapter 17. When we consider the narratives of the two women, we can see a number of parallels. In both chapter 12 and chapter 17, the woman is adorned regally. In chapter 12, the woman flees into the wilderness for refuge from the dragon. In chapter 17, John is taken to the wilderness and sees the woman riding a dragon. In Revelation 12, the woman is not called a mother, but she is described as giving birth and having many children. Here in chapter 17, the woman is a mother, but now in the negative sense, a mother of harlots. Both women are described as being nourished by God in chapter 12 and in chapter 17 by feasting and drinking on the blood of martyrs. And both those acts of eating and drinking are connected to death. In 12, the woman narrowly escapes being eaten by a beast. And here in 17, the woman drinks to her own destruction. Could the church be the one being seduced by the spirit of Babylon and in turn leading others astray, seducing others? Lightheart suggests that if Revelation has a coherent plot then we cannot ignore the fact that one woman disappears into the wilderness and another emerges from the wilderness. Perhaps the biggest giveaway is that the woman in chapter 17 is referred to as a whore, that she's referred to as a harlot in the first place. A whore is somebody who is unfaithful. So there must first be a covenant to break in order to be considered unfaithful, to be referred to as a harlot. Like Hosea with Gomer, the love that he had for her and her unfaithfulness. And so it is only the people of God in a covenant relationship with God who being unfaithful to God that can rightly be called harlots. Jerusalem then, is the only city that fits the description of the harlot, the prostitute city. And we heard the reality of Jerusalem's infidelity in the text that were read this morning from Ezekiel and from the Gospel of Matthew. And again, the book of Hosea echoes this kind of unfaithfulness. And in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21, we read how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Jerusalem, the harlot, is drunk with the blood of saints and martyrs. Jerusalem, as a harlot, 
has gotten into bed with the empire and together they persecute the states. The empire is doing her bidding. Consider the manner in which Jesus came to be crucified. The partnering of empire with the power of religion, of Pharisees and Pilate, Herod and Sadducees. Lightheart explains, the heavenly mother is Israel, or Zion, who, having given birth to Messiah, flees from the serpent, but is eventually seduced by him. The elites of Jerusalem and Judaism, the harlot and the kings of the land, play the harlot with the beast and prey on the saints. As mystery, the harlot represents a Judaism settled into her ancient ways, seated on her throne, drinking as if in Sabbath rest. She will not be disturbed, even by the coming of a Messiah and a new covenant, even if that Messiah is her own son. When Jerusalem sends Saul out breathing threats with authority to kill Jews who follow Jesus, Jerusalem becomes a mother devouring her own children. It's not entirely new. She already becomes a cannibal mother when she puts Jesus to death. She sees her kids in her own milk and devours them. The word harlot, or whore, as a noun, is used for the first time here in Revelation chapter 17. The harlot is the last figure to be introduced, but will be the first to be destroyed. Bear, referencing Lightheart, explained that the harlot holds a cup of blood which she drinks. But another cup is mentioned at the end of chapter 16, the cup of fury of God's wrath. There's a relationship between these two cups. The two cups are one and the same. The cup of holy blood that the harlot thinks is a victory feast is a cup of the fierce wrath of God. God gives blood to the bloodthirsty, and drunk cities are like real drunks, more unsteady on their feet, which stumble and fall. The whore and the beast, Jerusalem and Rome, but as they execute their common purpose, they execute God's purpose and fall into the very trap that they set for the saints. It is a self-destructive judgment that they bring upon themselves. They drink to their own destruction. And yet, there is good news. The destruction of the harlot paves the way for the revelation, for the unveiling of the bride. There will be a death, but it is a death that leads to resurrection. As we discussed in our previous Revelation message, a new creation is always birth from transformation. Lightheart contends that as the lamb died and rose, so the bride dies a harlot to be raised as a heavenly city. If we're going to look for the whore of Babylon, Brad Jerzak says, I'm going to start looking in the church. We are corrupt insofar as the whore of Babylon is all the vestments without the substance. Every time a church becomes turned in upon itself to make itself the reference, it becomes the harlot. Every time we partner with empire in ways that use power and coercion to oppress, each time we are seduced by pleasure, possessions, position, in ways that find us unfaithful to God, to Christ's mission of the restoration and reconciliation of all things, when it finds us turning our back on our calling to bring blessings to the nations and flourishing to all people, we are the harlot. The good news is that even when we find ourselves like Paul, saying, I know not why I do the things I know I shouldn't, and yet can't do the things I know I should. The good news is God has a way of getting us there. God is all in all, amen? 
St. John Kronstadt says, in a way that I think we can all relate to, my life is a lengthy, stubborn, and constant battle with myself. A battle which I am waging at present, being constantly fortified by the grace of God. Does that resonate with anybody else? My life is a lengthy, stubborn, and constant battle with myself, a battle which I am waging at present, being constantly fortified by God's grace. We can be our own worst enemy, but God's grace abounds. Through the struggle, through the cross, because of Christ, transformation, new life is ours. And so, as the church, we are reminded that in the end, we only get to our true self, our Christ-like self, by struggling with our false self, by entering into death and resurrection. We are the church. We are Jerusalem. We are in the wilderness, where Israel ended up after leaving Egypt, journeying in the desert until we reach the promised land. The temptation in the wilderness is to ride the back of the beast. It is what the accuser was counting on when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. The question for reflection is, how are we experiencing wilderness in our circumstances? And what are we tempted to cling to, to churn to? How are we experiencing wilderness in our circumstances? And what are we tempted to cling to, to turn to? Are we faithful to turn to Christ? Or are we seduced by other things? We are born into this world as Egypt, As we pass through the Red Sea of the waters of baptism, we enter the world of wilderness. As we take up the cross, we bear the struggle. The struggle that leads to our transformation, to the blessing and flourishing of others, to the redemption and restoration of all things. The sooner we take up our cross, the more fully we embrace the cross the easier it becomes. Jesus says, my burden is light. To the degree that we do, we enter and usher in the kingdom of God. Amen? Our help is in the name of the one who made heaven and earth, the star, the soul, you and me. Come, let us worship our maker. For we are the people of God's glorious pasture and the sheep of God's loving hand. Grace to you, beloveds, and peace from God our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ came, and we confess that we have sinned against you and others. In our thoughts, words, and deeds. We have failed to love our neighbors, and to a varying degrees, We have ignored your call to be a blessing. Have mercy upon us, Lord Jesus. Forgive us our lack of love. And cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That we may walk in your ways. And serve you in grace and love. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He does not abandon us to our fear or sin, no matter our past, no matter our regrets, no matter the wrong done to us or the wrong we have done to others. The Spirit calling us back to Christ. In Christ you are forgiven. When it was evening on the day, the first of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples were were closed for the fear of the Judeans, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. 
Paul. And having said this, Jesus showed him his hands, his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Messiah. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you all. Just as the living God has sent me to you, I also send all of you. Then when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them, and they said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of many, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of many, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, who was called Demias, the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Messiah. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hand, and put my finger in the mark of the nails on his side, I will not believe. And within eight days his disciples again were in the house, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the door that were shut, and stood among them, and said, Peace be with all of you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and look at my hands. Bring your hand, and put it in my side. And do not doubt, but rather believe. Thomas answered him, saying, My Savior, my God. Jesus said to him, It was because you have seen me that you believe. And blessed are those who have not seen, but yet believe. The table of bread and wine is now to be made ready. So come to this table. You who have much faith, and you would like to have more. You... You have been here often, and you have not been here for a while. You have tried to follow Jesus, and you have failed. Come, it is Christ who invites you to meet us here. Let us pray. Our Creator, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As, as we forgive those who trespass against us. us. And lead us, us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, glory forever and ever. ever. Amen. Loving God, through your goodness, we have this bread and wine to offer, which earth has <laughs> given and human hands have made. May we know your presence in the sharing of this bread, so that we may know your touch in all bread, all matter. We celebrate the life that Jesus has shared among his community through the centuries and shares with us now. Made one in Christ and one with each other, we offer these gifts and with them ourselves, a single, holy, living sacrifice. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. As we offer you our praise, dear Lord, hearts are filled high, for in the communion of your love, Christ comes closer to us, and we come closer to Christ. Therefore, with the whole realm of nature around us, with the earth, sea, and sky, we sing to you, with the angels of light who involve you, with all the saints before and beside us, with brothers and sisters, east and west, we sing to you, with our beloved ones separated us from now, yet in the midst you are close to us, we join in singing of your unending greatness. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is the name of the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is our brother Jesus, who walks with us the road of the world's suffering, and who is known to us in the breaking of the bread. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and having blessed it, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body given to you, in the same way, he took the wine, and after having given thanks for it, he poured it out and gave the cup to his disciples, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament with God 
sealed with my blood. Take this and share it. O oh, hear us, O Christ, and breathe your spirit upon us, and upon this bread and juice of the wine. May we come before us, your body, raven with our love, healing, renewing, and make us whole. And as the bread and juice which you now eat and drink are charged into us, may we be charged again into you, the bone of your bone, flesh of our flesh, loving and caring in the world. Amen. He whose table is open to all is now present in this bread. He whose word is welcome friend and stranger offers friendship through this cup. With people everywhere, we affirm God's goodness at the heart of humanity, plan more deeply than all that is wrong, the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us keep the peace. As God calls all people to the table of forgiveness, peace, and loving fellowship, we here at King's Court affirm an inclusive and open communion table. All persons, all ages, ethnicities, sexual orientations, identities, abilities, denominational affiliations, and other distinguishing features are welcome to partake of this sacrament, which affirms that we are all part of God's family and are to commune in, together in sacred relationship. Love, peace, and trust in Christ are the uniting virtues of this spiritual meeting place. Therefore, all who wish to join in this act of unity are invited to do so, providing that you do so in the spirit of peace and love for God and one another. All you who truly and earnestly desire to abandon your selfish ways, who want poor attitudes, hurtful words, and destructive actions transformed so that you might be a better mediator of the blessings of God. You who are wanting to grow in love for God and others and to live in love and peace with your neighbors. You who are striving to walk in the will and ways of Christ. Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and humbly make your honest confession to Almighty God. Come to the Lord's table, all you who love him. Come to the Lord's table and be at peace. As this next song plays, I'm going to invite you to come and receive the elements. Take them back to your pew and we will partake of them together. Wayne, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you. Receive and rejoice. Mary, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you. Receive and rejoice. Amen. Deborah, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you. Rejoice. Miss Eunice, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. Richard, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. Eileen, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. <laughs> Bill, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. Dorothy, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. BJ, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. Joel, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. Miss Sue, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. Miss Bess, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. Miss Bonnie, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. Sue, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. Kathy, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. Miss May, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. Miss Wilma, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love poured out for you, rejoice. The body of Christ given for you, receive and rejoice. The cup of love poured out for you, and may the love of Christ pour forth from you. Receive and rejoice. Living God, in this sacrament we have shared in your eternal kingdom, may we who taste this mystery forever serve you in faith, hope, and love. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, 
in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen.
if a prayer has been used as a sword against you and your heart against you and your word i pray that this prayer is a plowshare of sorts May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again in through our doors.